Volume Three, Chapter Three of That Unfortunate Marriage by Francis Eleanor Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Each mortal's private feelings are the measure of the importance of events to him, and it often happens that while our neighbors are pitying or envying us on account of some circumstance which all the world agrees must have a weighty bearing on our fate, we are mainly indifferent to it and are occupied with some inner grief or joy which would seem to them very trivial. To have received and rejected an offer of marriage from a man worth fifty thousand a year would have been deemed by most of May Cheffington's acquaintance about as important an event as could have happened to her, short of death. But to her it was absolutely as nothing, compared with the fact that Owen was on the point of returning to England, and that he was to live in Mrs. Bransby's house. Why did this second fact seem to embitter the sweetness of the first? no it was not the fact she told herself that was bitter the bitterness lay in the manner of its coming to her knowledge why had not owen written to her there could be no reason to conceal it of course none owen was doing all that was right no doubt but to allow her to hear of this step for the first time from theodore bransby at a dinner-table conversation this it was which irked her so at least she had declared to herself last night then the tone in which her uncle and all of them had spoken of mrs bransby and owen had jarred upon her painfully theodore had not joined in the tasteless banter but then theodore's way of receiving it with a partly stiff partly deprecatory air as though there could possibly be anything serious in it was almost worse the pathway of life which had stretched so clear and fair before her but a short while ago seemed now to have contracted into a tangled maze in which she lost herself the events of the morning had made may resolve that all secrecy as to her engagement must come to an end she must see owen immediately on his arrival in london but how to do so she did not know whether he was or was not in england at that very moment well at all events she knew mrs bransby's address and could write to him there the thought gave her a pang and the pang was intensified by the sudden and vivid perception as one sees a whole landscape by a lightning flash out of a black sky that it was caused by jealousy jealousy she may cheffington jealous and of owen yes it might be painful humiliating incredible but it was true the flash had been inexorably sharp and clear to young creatures every revelation that they even they are subject to the common woes pains and passions of humanity about which they may have talked glibly enough is an amazement and a shock still earlier in our earthly course we doubt that death himself can touch us what child ever realizes that it must die it is only after many lessons that we begin to accept our share of moral frailties and afflictions as a matter of course poor may felt sick at heart oh if she could but see granny she longed for the motherly affection which had never failed her since the day her father left her a rather forlorn little waif whom no one seemed ready to love or welcome in the old house in friars row she thought that to sit quite still and silent by granny's knee while granny's kind old hand softly stroked her hair would charm away all her troubles or at least lull them to sleep but for the present she could not rest when she left her uncle and felt secure from interruption in her own room she sat down and wrote two letters the first was to owen begging him to come and see her without delay and at the same time telling him that circumstances had arisen which made it desirable to declare their engagement the second letter was to granny to granny she poured out her gratitude she thanked her and scolded her in a breath who had ever been so generous and so careful to conceal their generosity and yet granny had done very wrong to make such a sacrifice as was involved in giving up the old home in friars row had i known this a week ago wrote may i do believe i should have tried to coax mr bragg into breaking the lease and making you go back to the old house which you loved but i cannot ask any favour of mr bragg now then she told her grandmother all about her interview with mr bragg and her aunt's bitter disappointment and her uncle's kind behaviour although she could see that he was disappointed too i wonder she added if you will be as astonished as i was perhaps not i remember some things you said when i told you my grand scheme for marrying miss patty oh dear me i feel like someone who has been walking in his sleep calmly and unconsciously tripping over the most insecure places but now i have been suddenly awakened and i feel chilly and frightened and all astray when she had written them she resolved to post the letters herself 
since she had volunteered to take her little cousins out for a walk occasionally the stringent rule which forbade her to leave the house unattended by a servant had been relaxed it was so very convenient to get rid of the little boys for an hour or two at a time it left cecile free to do a great deal of needlework a large proportion of it expended on the alteration and retrimming and so forth of may's own toilettes mrs dormer smith was strictly conscientious as to that and since may never went beyond the limits of the neighbouring square there could be no objection to the arrangement one point however aunt pauline had insisted on that these walks should always take place in the morning or at all events during that portion of the day which did duty for the morning in her vocabulary the proprieties greatly depend as we know on chronology and many things which are permissible before luncheon become taboo immediately after it by the time may had finished her letters however it was well on in the afternoon carriages were rolling through the fashionable quarters of the town and the footman's rat-tat-tat sounded monotonously like a gigantic tom-tom sacred to the worship of society may went downstairs and opening the hall door found herself in the street alone for the first time since she had lived under her aunt's roof there was a pillar letter-box she knew not far distant to this she proceeded and dropped her letters into it it had been a fine day for a london winter but the last faint glimmer of daylight had almost disappeared as she turned to go back home there was an assemblage of vehicles waiting before a house which she had passed on her way to the post-box now as she returned there was a stir among them servants were calling up the coachman and opening and shutting carriage doors a number of fashionably dressed persons mostly women came down the steps of the house and drove away may paused a moment to let a couple of ladies sweep past her on their way to the carriage as she did so she heard her name called and looking round she saw clara bertram's face at the window of a cab drawn up near the curbstone is it really you exclaimed clara as they shook hands i could scarcely believe my eyes what are you doing here alone i have been posting some letters then reading an expression of surprise in the other girl's eyes she added quickly you wonder why i should have done so myself for, for a simple reason i did not wish the address of one of them to be seen but granny knows all about it i am quite sure dear you have some good reason for what you have done answered clara in her quiet sincere tones and you asked may what are you doing here i have been singing a matinee at that house i was just about to drive off when i caught a glimpse of you i was not sure that it was not your ghost in the dusk i suppose you are constantly engaged now yes i have a great deal to do oh i hear of you your praises are in every one's mouth lady moppet declares you are rapidly becoming the first concert singer of the day she is as proud of you as if she had invented you indeed she does say you are her discovery as if you were a polynesian island i could find it in my heart to envy you clara it must be so glorious to be independent and earn one's own living clara smiled a faint little smile i am thankful to be able to earn something she said but i don't think i should care so much about it if it were only for myself no of course dear i know rejoined may quickly she had been told that the young singer entirely supported an invalid father and sister then she added your voice is a great gift there are so few things a woman can do to earn money why one would suppose that you wanted to earn money said clara smiling perhaps clara looked more closely at her friend the street lamps were now lighted and she could see may's face distinctly you are not looking well dear she exclaimed you seem fagged i'm sick of london i want to go home to granny and be at peace answered may wearily then she went on quickly to stave off any possible questionings as to her state of mind but i must return for the present to my aunt's house good-bye stay cried clara will you not get into the cab and let me drive you home drive it is an affair of some two or three minutes at most well then if you have half an hour to spare let me drive you round the square and then drop you at home i have been wanting for three or four days past to speak to you quietly i can't bear to lose this rare opportunity we do not meet very often then seeing that her friend hesitated she asked are you thinking about the cost of the cab for me yes answered may frankly i thought so that is just like you but indeed you need have no scruples the cab is engaged for the afternoon when i sing at people's houses unless they send a carriage for me the cab fare is considered in my wages do come in may complied and the cab moved away slowly when they had proceeded a few yards clara said i wanted to tell you i think it right to tell you something i have learned on good authority your father i hope it won't distress you is really married may's first thought was that here again her aunt pauline had deceived her are you sure she asked yes i think i may say so and how did you learn it from valie 
oh from signor valli but you told me he was not to be trusted in some ways not but i do not doubt what he says on this subject he has no motive to invent the information he cares nothing about the matter except that i think he rather likes la miss sheffington than not is she a foreigner asked may with a little more interest than she had hitherto shown her listless way of receiving the news had surprised her friend yes an italian at least she is italian by language if not by law for she comes from trieste but she is almost cosmopolitan for she has travelled about the world a great deal she is or was an opera singer her name in the theatre is bianca moretti she was rather celebrated at one time clara paused a moment and then added i hope this news does not grieve you dear no answered may dreamily it does not grieve me if my father is content why should i grieve he and i have been parted in spirit as well as body for so many years that his marriage can make but little difference to me i was afraid you might feel of course captain cheffington's family will look on it as a dreadful mesalliance may was silent for a few minutes then she said a very unexpected thing poor woman i hope he's good to her i suppose said clara rather hesitatingly that the reason why captain cheffington has not announced his marriage to his relations is that he thinks they would object to receive an opera singer possibly answered may in her heart she thought the reason is that he cares nothing for any of us it must be that proceeded clara for as far as i can make out there seems to be no concealment about it in brussels then they arrived at mrs dormer smith's house and may alighted and bade her friend farewell thank you clara she said for telling me the truth i loathe mysteries and concealments when one thinks of it they are despicable unless when one conceals something to shield others suggested clara gently she had told her friend what she believed to be the truth so far as the fact of her father's marriage was concerned but she had not given her all the details and comments which signor valli had imparted to her on the subject his view of the matter was not flattering to captain cheffington valli declared with cynical plainness of speech that captain cheffington had married la bianca merely to have the right to confiscate her professional earnings latterly these had become very scanty la bianca did not grow younger and her voice was rapidly failing her a good deal of gambling had gone on in her house at one time but it had been put a stop to or at least shorn of its former proportions by the ugly incident of which miss polly piper had brought back aversion to oldchester since that things had not gone well with the cheffington menage captain cheffington had become insupportable irritable impossible he was moreover a malade imaginaire a querulous selfish tyrannous fellow always bewailing his hard fate and the sacrifice he had made in so far derogating from his rank as to marry an opera singer la bianca was a slave to his caprices to be sure she was not precisely a lamb there were occasions when she flamed up and made quarrels and scenes but said signor valli he is an enormous egoist and with a woman the bigger egoist you are the surer to subjugate her la bianca would have stabbed a man who'd loved her devotedly for half the ill-treatment she endures from that cold stiff ramrod of an englishman such was vincenzo valli's version of the case and clara bertram in listening to him believed that in the main it was a true one valli had recently been in brussels where he had seen the cheffingtons and one or two other foreign musicians whom she knew had come upon them from time to time and had given substantially the same account of them as to persons in the rank of life to which captain cheffington still claimed to belong they were no more likely to come across him now than if he were living on the top of the andes may went into the house wearily in the hall she met her uncle frederick who had just come in and had seen the cab drive away who was that with you may he asked in some surprise it was miss bertram she answered then she asked her uncle to step for a moment into the dining-room when he had done so and closed the door she said quietly my father is married to a foreign opera singer they are living in brussels did you and aunt pauline know this know it certainly not may was relieved to hear this and drew a long breath the sensation of living in an atmosphere of deception had oppressed her almost with a feeling of physical suffocation she then told her uncle all that clara bertram had said mr dormer smith puckered his brows and looked more disturbed than she had expected this will be another blow for your aunt he said gloomily i don't see why aunt pauline should distress herself she answered coldly my father is not likely to trouble her married or unmarried my father seems determined to keep aloof from us all then she went to her own room 
mr dormer smith shrank from communicating this news to his wife and as he went upstairs he anticipated a disagreeable scene he did not very greatly care about the matter himself for he agreed with may that it was unlikely augustus would trouble any of the family with his presence and to keep away was all that he required of his brother-in-law on entering his wife's room he found her still in a morning wrapper reclining on her long chair but her hair had been dressed and she announced her intention of coming down to dinner her countenance too wore an unexpected expression of placidity almost cheerfulness the country post had arrived and there were several letters scattered on a little table by mrs stormer smith's elbow her husband went and placed himself with his back to the fire which was burning with a pleasant glow in the grate well he said in a sympathizing tone to his wife how are you feeling now pauline they had not met since his outburst about may and he had been rather nervously uncertain of his reception pauline never sulked never stormed and rarely scolded but when she felt herself to be injured she would be overpoweringly plaintive her plaintiveness seemed to wrap round you and damp you and chill you to the bone like a scotch mist and when used retributively was felt by her husband at all events to be very terrible but on this occasion as has been said there was a certain mild serenity in her face which was reassuring thanks frederick she answered there seems to be a little less pressure on the brain smithson bathed my forehead for three quarters of an hour after you were gone mr dormer smith hastened to change the subject post in i see he said any news i have a very nice letter from constance hadlow answered pauline with her eyes absently fixed on the fire how thoughtful that girl is what tact what proper feeling ah the contrast between her and may is painful at times mr dormer smith made a little inarticulate sound which might mean anything despite her beauty which he admired miss hadlow was no great favourite of his but he would not imperil the present calm in his domestic atmosphere by saying so misfortunes pursued pauline still gazing at the fire never come singly they say and really i believe it does miss hadlow announce any misfortune oh no at least we are bound not to look on it as a misfortune who could wish him to linger poor fellow she is staying near combe park and she says lucius has been quite given up by the doctors it is a question of days perhaps of hours no by george poor old lucius returned mr dormer smith with a touch of real feeling in his tone of course this will make an immense difference in may's prospects i don't mean to say that she will easily find another millionaire with such extraordinarily liberal ideas about settlements as mr bragg hinted to me this morning that is humanly speaking not possible said mrs dormer smith solemnly still the affair may not be such an irretrievable disaster as we feared how do you mean asked frederick whose mind as we know moved rather slowly it must make a difference to her repeated his wife in a musing tone the only child and heiress of the future viscount castlecombe of course by george i didn't think of that at the moment yes gus is the next i suppose that's quite certain mrs dormer smith did not even condescend to answer this query but merely raised her eyebrows with a superior and melancholy smile frederick pondered a minute or two then he said you say heiress but i don't think your uncle would leave gus a pound more than he couldn't help leaving him i fear that is likely still there is much of the land that must come to augustus and uncle george has enormously improved the estate do you know i begin to hope that i may see my poor unfortunate brother come back and take his proper place in the world when i remember what he was five-and-twenty years ago it does seem cruel that he should have been absolutely eclipsed during all this time i recollect so well the day he first appeared in his uniform he was brilliant poor augustus mr dormer smith felt that the difficulty of telling his wife what he had just heard assumed a new shape he had feared to add to the load of what pauline considered family misfortunes now it seemed as if his news would dash her rising spirits and darken roseate hopes he passed his large hand over his mouth and chin and said with his eyes fixed uneasily on his wife who was still contemplating the fire with an air of abstraction ah yes but there may be a lady castlecombe to find a place in the world for not improbable i hope there may be augustus is a little past the prime of life it would compensate for much if i'm sorry to say pauline that there's no chance of that i mean of such a marriage as you're thinking of i came upstairs on purpose to tell you in one way it won't make any difference to us and i'm sure your brother has never deserved much affection or consideration from you but still i know it will worry you mrs dormer smith sat upright 
with her hands grasping the two arms of her chair and said with a sort of despairing calm be good enough to go on frederick i entreat you to be explicit i dare say you mean well but i do not think i can endure much more suspense well you know the rumours we've heard from time to time about that disreputable italian woman in brussels opera singer or something of the kind well i'm afraid there's no use deluding ourselves i think it comes on good authority your brother has married her End of chapter 3